everybody in this room can agree we know a lot about teaching and learning in higher education, and we're learning more each and every day, especially from discipline-based researchers, a lot of whom are on campus here. Um, Joe and I have been feeling for a while that we need better instruments to study teaching as a phenomenon, that in actually getting to some of the nuances and complexity of teaching practice, we still have a long ways to go. And so this talk is about an instrument that we've developed and we're currently revising and fine-tuning, in part based on a reaction from audiences like yourselves, so that we can improve the study of teaching and then at some point connect it to specific aspects of student learning. Okay. So quickly, we'll give you a, a background on the state of the art in studying teaching in higher education. Background of the instrument, um, and then we're going to do a quick trial run of using the instrument, which is the four-pager that I handed out. Some of you who are coming in late may not have that instrument, which I apologize. Um, and again, the goal is for all of you to leave here, just to get a sense of how difficult it is to empirically study teaching as a, as a phenomenon. And we're trying to do this, not just so that we can develop some basic insights and knowledge about teaching, but also so we can develop an instrument that practitioners like yourselves and across the country doing faculty development, working on teaching and learning, etc., have an instrument that can be used in their local settings. So that's one of our goals. We want to apply this research so people in the field can use it. So quickly, uh, most of you know all this stuff, but why do we want to study teaching? And this is something last week that I had to kind of spend a lot of time on. Um, first, you know, teaching related to learning. That's been established. Um, probably a bit more at the K-12 level and in higher ed, but we're doing a lot of really good work in post-secondary level, as you know. Program evaluation. We want to find out <clears throat> if you go in and do an intervention or faculty development, does teaching practice change over time? That's one reason why you want to study what goes on in the classroom. Sometimes institutions or departments or colleges want to know what's going on um, in the classroom, so they'll do an audit just to kind of get what's, what are faculty actually doing in the classroom at time A. Professional development consults, people may meet with an individual instructor to say, I observed you last week, here's some strengths, here's some weaknesses, things you could work on. But to do that, you need some sort of description of uh, classroom practice. And then finally, self-assessment. You may not have that con uh, consult or a teaching and learning center at hand, so you may just want to do some sort of self-assessment. And again, you need some sort of you know, description of what you're actually doing in the classroom. So currently, um, <clears throat> the different ways that people are studying teaching. The first and probably most dominant is looking at the specific teaching methods that people use. Lecture, problem-based learning, um, small group work, peer instruction. So teaching is kind of uh, looked at at a higher level to, to capture what goes on in the 50 minutes of the classroom solely in terms of the teaching methods being used. That's probably the dominant approach to studying instruction. Another one is looking at more specific behaviors. And Harry Murray really revolutionized this in the mid-90s. Instead of looking just at the teaching methods, let's break it down a little bit and look at the clarity of an instructor's speech. How do they organize their class? How do they sequence content? Um, gesture. There's a lot of research going on now on gesture. Question wait time. How long do instructors wait after they pose a question? Um, another one <clears throat> is instructor cognition. There's a lot of work going on in beliefs, uh, approaches, self-efficacy of instructors, and how that relates to how they teach, and then how does that relate to student learning. Um, another one is looking at student-teacher interactions. Again, uh, question wait time is a good example, but also student-based proxy measures, student ratings, and the semester evaluations. That's a very common way to study teaching. Um, you're not directly looking at the instructor. You're actually getting the student's perspective of the quality of instruction. Instructional technology, the use of specific tools like clickers or Blackboard, things like that. That's an increasingly popular field where people are looking at that to investigate faculty teaching practices. Another one is the temporal progression of a class. Because <clears throat> things change over the course of 50 or 90 minutes. <coughs> Rarely does an instructor just use one method or one approach for 50 minutes. So people are breaking it down and looking at how things progress over time. <clears throat> and then finally, class planning, um, curricular planning, is a key component of teaching. And so that's another area of research. And in particular, how that planning procedure um, is influenced 
by some of the organizational features of institutions, the culture, um, personnel policies, etc. Okay. So it's just a quick snapshot of how people are approaching teaching. Methodologically, some of the ways that people are doing that, probably the most common um, is surveys. And some of you may have seen this, gotten an email about filling out the FESI, which is currently under fire in a large way in higher education for its validity. But <clears throat> essentially what you're asked to do is to name or tell, uh, these are all methods, lecture, teach, and discussion. You say from 0 to 100% how can you use that. Okay? And so that's the, the, the measure of teaching. And this, these data are being used by a lot of administrators to make decisions about resource allocation, curriculum development, things like that. Um, another one is interviews where you just ask people to say, what do you do? Um, either through think alouds or just a, a retrospective account or just a description of generally how they teach. Observations is what we think is the best way to study teaching. You actually go into the classroom and watch somebody. And one of the most common instruments is the Reform Teaching Observation Protocol. I think some of you may be familiar with that. And essentially what this has is an open-ended form, which is really common in faculty development, where the analyst is in the back of the room, and they note, in this case, the time, and then what happens at that time point. So it's up to the analyst to really determine, wow, that was really interesting, so I'm going to jot down the time, and then what happens. The other part is they have different categories, and you fill that out at the end of the class, and it's built upon a scale to determine how reformed that instructor is. How much are they in accordance with best practices in um, educational research and learning sciences? Um, now, from our perspective, we're uncomfortable with this approach because we feel that before we can determine how reformed somebody is, we want to actually describe what they are, and not to have a priori assumptions and equality built into an instrument. And so that's one of the things that motivated us to um, develop the t -doc. And then finally, experiments um, are an extremely common way to study teaching. You manipulate you know, some variable. And commonly, it is the teaching method that's being manipulated. You know, this teacher's going to use lecture, this teacher's going to use problem-based learning. So briefly, <coughs> we embarked on this four-year study of teaching and learning in three research institutions. And we wanted a structured instrument so we didn't want something that was just a blank page where analysts could fill out anything. We wanted something structured so that we could compare across analysts, um, have it be replicable. And we wanted it to be descriptive because we felt that we didn't really know precisely what's going on in the classroom. You know, we wanted a really grounded, and this comes back to my anthropological background, we wanted a grounded description of what actually happened. We felt that we can't just focus on teaching methods. There's too many dimensions to teaching that we need to capture. So, Teaching methods is an important part, but it's only one. And we wanted it to be used across disciplines or applicable across disciplines and even institution types. So again, we did a pretty uh, lengthy review of the literature, didn't find anything that fit the bill, um, especially because we wanted to look at temporal variability, how things unfold um, throughout a class. And so luckily, a colleague down the hall, who Joda previously worked with, had developed an instrument to use to study science inquiry teaching in middle school. And what he had was a, a framework where you know, the analyst collects data at five minute intervals. And so we adapted that general framework to develop this instrument. And theoretically, um, what we're drawing on is activity theory, where we're looking at the teacher in the classroom, not just as teaching activity as being the province of the individual instructor, but also it's the teacher in interaction with students, and with the artifacts in the room, um, and also the artifacts within the institutional environment. So um, each of you should have one of these. And on the front, <coughs> it's basically just the analyst fills out, you know, what kind of class are you observing? Do we have more of these? Are there any more? Uh, here's some. Yeah, I think there may be a couple of them. I can so share. I'll share with you, Ed. You can do and for the instructor and course characteristics, it's really important to capture, not just so that you know what you're observing, but we're particularly interested in analyzing data across instructor types, you know, lecturers, tenure status, um, stuff like that, class size. That's actually our next analytic step, is to compare all of our data based on class size. So the more of these characteristics you can capture, the more ways you can slice and dice the data later on. The heart of the instrument is the coding. Um, and we'll go into that in a second. 
But that's sort of, we have a code bank comprised of a lot of different codes that describe teaching practice. And the idea is that based on the needs of the institution and the, the researchers that are actually using this, you can pick and choose which codes you want and populate the instrument with it. So physicists may have a different set of codes they're interested in other than biologists or chemists. There may be different instructional technologies that they use. There may be different teaching methods that are less relevant for one discipline than another. So we wanted this to be really customizable. And then there's field notes. Um, just at the end, you know, you're supposed to kind of debrief and write a bunch of notes. OK. Oh. So if you flip over to the next page, you can see the list of all the codes. And I developed this particular instantiation of the instrument to code an introductory bio class. And so this has a reduced amount of code. Um, there's teaching methods. That's on the top there. We have lecturing, illustration, anecdotes, demonstration, small group work, etc. I should point out that lecturing is, for us, a problematic code. Because again, lecturing, you know, it contains a lot of kind of sub-behaviors and sub-components, some of which are the use of illustrations and anecdotes. Uh, the use of different types of questions, different rhetorical strategies. Uh, but we still felt compelled to capture when somebody's like me, standing in front of a bunch of people and just talking. So that's a code, but um, we deliberately included some that are meant to be co-coded with lecturing to demonstrate how lecturing is actually comprised of these more nuanced behaviors. We have cognitive demand, which is um, I have a little asterisk there because it's a high inference code, as Harry Murray calls it. It requires that the analyst to infer from the teacher's behavior what kind of cognitive demand they're demanding of the student. Um, we have receive and memorize, understand problem solving, create ideas, integrate prior information, and make connections to the real world. Could, do you mind if we interrupt or do you for no, questions no. at the end? I'm going to decide from the fact that I just interrupted and posed. <laughs> so continue to interrupt. <laughs> so, um, where did these come from? I mean, it sort of strikes me as sort of balloons-ish, compressed, balloons taxonomy, compressed in a way, adding a couple of other dimensions. So, most of the codes were based on our colleagues' uh, middle school science inquiry instrument. Okay. But most of those were tailored for the, and Joe, you can correct me because you know more about that instrument. A lot of them were tailored for the middle school classroom. Um, you know, because there's a lot more student-teacher interactions than there is in a 400-person lecture hall. And so, we... we no, I'm, I'm asking about, yeah, cognitive Just demand. Cognitive demand. Yeah, predict, uh, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that came from the surveys of enacted curriculum, which is something developed at WCER. But we changed, actually, a, a couple of the codes. Um, <coughs> creating ideas was one that we changed as well. I don't know, that was actually the only one that we changed. But it came from the surveys of oh, enacted sure. curriculum, which was developed by Andy Porter and uh, John Smith, and they still do a lot of that. Is there a sense of hierarchy among them? Well, that's so that's, that's a debate. So some people say absolutely there's a hierarchy. Um, the way we approached it when I did this before in the middle school context and here was actually to sort of flip it and just say, treat it more categorical. That, well, sometimes you have to receive and memorize information. Sometimes you have to integrate. Sometimes you have to create. And rather than think of them as sort of a progression, uh, as a hierarchical progression. But certainly... There's a debate there to be had, but we didn't necessarily think it was an important one to solve for the purposes of, of coding what was going on. Then the last category is instructional tools, and that's basically the technology artifacts the instructor uses. We have posters up there because chemists like to indicate uh, the periodic table, so we need to capture that. And a really important part of using this instrument is training and establishing iterator reliability if there's more than one. Uh, Analysts. And so for us, we went through a two-day training session. There was three of us where we watched tons of Google videos of instructors. You're going to see one in a minute. And coded it, talked about it. Okay, what do you think is problem solving? What do you think is received memorized? Did another round of coding. We just did that for two days. And then the last one, you know, we calculated our Cohen's Kappa to see where we were at. We still want to get a little bit higher in terms of our IRR. Um, so the, our next wave of data collection, which will happen next spring, we're going to try to refine our training and do a little bit of a better job. But the main point is it's a really important part of using an instrument like this. I'll, I'll say something real quick with the Cohen's Kappa. It's a really conservative measure of agreement. Right. As, as those of you who are familiar, 
it, it basically says it's accounting for chance, so it's arguing that if you weren't sure which one to code, you more or less closed your eyes and hit and coded whatever one you thought uh, or whatever one you landed on. But when in fact we know that there was probably more reasoning that was going on uh, involved in the process. So it, it does punish a little bit more um, than is probably true in reality. But on the other hand, it's considered a better better measure than if you just did pure uh, agreement. Where, for example, if you had the same code, then that counts as a point towards agreement because it doesn't have any indication. Uh, of whether or not any of the codes were coded by chance alone. So it's, th that would be a very, maybe some people call it liberal uh, form of agreement where we use probably the most conservative. We figured starting at the most conservative is the best way to go. But definitely, um, you typically want it at a minimum 0 0.7, 0 0.8 or higher is ideal. 0.7 isn't so bad from what I'm aware of. No, no, I mean, that's that's a good a good score. Yeah. It seems like the tools category can be higher because there's less subjectivity. No. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was a question. That was the question last week. Yeah, How do you mess up tools? Upon reflection, we realized, wait a minute, that should be higher. So that's something that we definitely need to work on for our next round of... Really? I, I, well, I don't know. I mean, I think defining what counts as a tool and what the primary tool is... They, they they have to, yeah. This is what counts as tools. tools. Yeah, yeah, but you can, so you can mark point one, right? right. Yeah. So pro I'm guessing... Okay. Is it, we we yeah. have to debate whether language is a tool. Well, but I mean, so is the projector like being used continually? Does it get circled in every? If it's used at all in that time slot, that's when it's being circled. I mean, I think that's that's where some of the error comes from, which is when did that person stop using the tool? Even if it's, right. it's Matt, is still it on, if, yeah, it's still on it. or still present. Maybe the object is still getting passed around the classroom, but the instructor has moved on. Um, yeah. So I think. Yeah. I mean, I think what counts as a tool and. Uh, who counts as a tool? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, you can all get pencils or a pen out because in a minute we'll Ooh. show a brief clip of this biology faculty member doing a lesson just so you can get a sense of what it's like to not only use this instrument but to try to capture empirically some of the fine grained elements of classroom practice. So, if you were doing this in a research project, you would be intimately familiar with all the codes and this instrument. You're obviously not, so this would be a little difficult. Um, but, just, if you're flipping back saying, wow, what does IL mean? Just, if you were doing this, you would be doing that. Um, and, if you notice the blank area underneath all the little letters, if there's anything that occurs to you that is interesting about the instructor's behavior, how he's talking about the content, um, Physical character, anything that's not captured in our codes, that's what that area is for. It's take notes. So you really want to capture what's going on. Because um, we're losing a lot of stuff necessarily by just focusing on reasoning. Why do you say to use a pencil? Oh, it's a pencil or pen. No, I mean on the, on the instrument, though, it's a pencil. Oh, oh because so you might need to erase these things. Yeah. Absolutely. Why are we hugging the demand? <laughs> We're exploring the prospect of digitizing this instrument so you could use an iPad and as you're observing. You have every five minute interval on the screen, you just code and then it automatically flips to the next five minute interval. And then you'll see in a minute, um, putting all these data into a, a spreadsheet is kind of onerous. So if we do, do the digitization, this can be really nice. So we spend hours entering data. So this is a five minute clip, correct? This is a five minute already on the computer. Yeah, so you only really need the, the column, the first column. The zero to four column. Zero to four minutes. <laughs> okay. Ready? Yeah. Is that one? Yeah. 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 Oh, no. That works in exactly the same logic as here, that it basically comes along, it scans the DNA, it finds the, the bump, it makes, because this is not a proper base pair, and then fills it in, and you're back to ordinary DNA with a G, C base pair. There's one little wrinkle. This cell, this for this system to work, it has to do one other thing that's different from that kind of DNA repair. Can anybody see what it is? Why don't you talk to the person next to you, see, see if you can figure out. There's, this system must be doing something else in order for this to work. 
Okay, you can ask somebody. Anything? What if I what if I remove the key? Would that work? You got it. So what would happen if I took it at the G instead? Say I made the little gap over on, on this strand instead. I'll cut it here. Yeah, so which one's the one that's right? The old strand or the new strand? The old strand, yeah. So see, this is the old and this is the new. And the, the term that's usually used is known as the daughter strand, the new strand. So the other thing this, this system has to do is it not only has to be able to detect that there's an incorrect little base pair in there, but it also has to um, uh, know which is the parental strand, the template strand, and which is the daughter strand, the newly synthesized strand. And this system makes the assumption that the strand that's old is the one that's correct, and the mistake is on the new one. You guys see that? Okay. So that gets another two or three orders of magnitude in accuracy, and that's what brings it up. Now, the, the people who made the, this, who originally formulated this, this model for mismatch repair, complete with the feature uh, that, it, that it needed to recognize the old and new strand. And that's a bit of a trick if you think about it, because it's DNA on both sides. And there, there are several different ways used in nature, so I'm not going to go into it, but there's at least a couple of different ways of doing that trick. You could sort of see if you were the replication fork, and you talk to that. You could certainly, just from the geometry of that, if you wanted, you could probably keep track of who's old and new. E. coli has a, a very cute trick, but it's not universal, so I won't go into it. But the people who, who did the seminal stuff, um, I had to just quickly show you a couple of pictures. When I showed you that picture of, at the, D, the DNA 50th, the guy sitting in the front row was Miroslav Radman, who was one of the two people. He's a European scientist, originally from Croatia, and he collaborated with someone you've heard about before, Matt Messelson, uh, who was up at Harvard, and it was with the messelson stahl experiment that showed the semi-conservative mechanism of DNA repair. This was a little reception, and Matt was talking to Alex Rich, who's one in the MIT biology department, and I was amused because, remember how um, Vernon told you how Francis Crick would run up and down the stairs uh, at the, in the Cambridge lab, and he was talking all the time. And I've heard Vernon say you could never really tell whether an idea came from Watson or Crick, because we just talk, 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 talk all the time. So this was at a res sort of a nice reception at the uh, at the DNA 50th. And, and within a couple of minutes, I looked over, and there were Vernon <laughs> Bradman and Matt Nessels, and talk, talk, talk. They were over in the corner drawing pictures on a on a uh, on a board. I also showed you actually a picture of one of the genes that's involved in recognizing this mismatch. Because there's a protein that recognizes that mismatch, and it's given the name of uh, MUDEF. And when I was showing you some proteins that had one that had a lot of alpha helices, this is actually a picture of MUDEF. It's a dimer. That's why some of it's green and some of it's blue. And it's recognized. This is DNA viewed end on, and it's recognizing a GT mismatch in DNA. Okay, so <coughs> was that how, how many minutes was that? It seemed like it was more than one segment of time. Maybe it was wrong. Right. So, uh, four and a half minutes. Or? Yeah, I, I segmented off a five minute chunk of time. <coughs> yeah, when you're coding this for fifty minutes, and you're focused <laughs> on really fine grained yes. behavior, it's pretty onerous. It's like you have a headache and everything. <coughs> um, like any research? <laughs> how was it? Um, any thoughts? Comments? using lab equipment in the front. 
So yeah, it wasn't just gesturing or you know, working something out of the board. But again, that gets to how difficult it is to name behaviors, parse them out, and then code them. Yeah, it seems also that something like a rhetorical question is a little bit hard to define because sometimes people ask questions to the class not necessarily waiting for the full response of the class. And is that a rhetorical question or not? Mm-hmm. It seems hard to, to judge that sometimes. Right. Yeah, we, the criteria we used there was did could if you could tell, could you tell that they intended to actually elicit a response but moved on because they just were uncomfortable with the waiting? Because some people you can tell don't like it when nobody responds so they because that silence is killing them. So they move on quickly. Whereas other people, it's it can be actually quite clear when they didn't really intend for a response because there's there's just a hint in their tone that they were using that as a rhetorical tool to then set up their point. So we just we that's why we showed each other many different videos and then if we saw when we would see something like that we would say, pause and deliberate what do you, you know what did you think that meant and why and come to a consensus um, but it, that's it's very challenging. What's the, like, so under the CQ, you have, like, understand? As an example of the comprehension question, like, I, I'm just wondering, is that literally, like, what you mean by comprehension question? Are you guys getting it? Because, you know, because, I mean, he said that, but it was basically rhetorical. He went right on after right. that. But earlier, he had said a question that I wouldn't have, you know, I just wondering, is that comprehensive question meant to be just at that level? Like, are you guys getting this? And not an actual question beyond that? Well, that's where, in some cases, you may be co-coding that with rhetorical question if they actually don't intend for somebody to answer it. But in most cases, we intended that for, P, for that to mean when somebody presents some information, talks about some information, do you all understand? Do you get it? And actually waits for a response just to get a sense of everything went over their heads or not. But not a not an actual specific question. Like he asked a more specific question. Yeah, I coded that, but maybe I coded it wrong. A conceptual question. Yeah. Because oh, work out the reasons here. What's the mechanism? Go. Right. I, I control it. I. That's what I coded. Well, that's why we have a high kappa. But later he asked. <laughs> he, he asked just to understand. Do you see that? Sometimes. It would seem as a. As a method, you, you would almost have to videotape these to go back and to really accurately capture because the questions fly so quickly. How are you? I mean, it's not possible as a researcher to keep up. We're missing tons of data by that. But ideally, we would be videotaping, and I think we may try to do that for our next wave of data collection. We found a lot of instructors do not want to be videotaped for whatever reason, um, <laughs> but we got a lot of flat out no's. Or when we ask, can we observe you as long as you don't record or videotape me? I'll also say too that it slows way down. It's like when, because um, I'm always looking for ways to compare myself to professional athletes, but you know how sometimes athletes say that the ball slows down for them, even though obviously it's not, but it just slows down because they're in that zone. When you've done this over and over again, it does slow down to the extent that it's just much easier to capture everything. And you're no longer even looking at, you know, what code, like, you're not looking at your code list anymore. Yeah, you know what it is. yeah so you, you just get better at, at picking it up. And, and obviously, some are more difficult than others. I mean, this one was, there was a lot more going on. I mean, some, it's actually very monotonous and routine, and it's really easy. Um, but yeah. some are, are very challenging. So it's, but it seems like overall, you'd, you'd be able to get the, like, course. Even if you missed a few things, you'd get kind of course. I mean, you do it every five minutes. Yeah, so you get to kind of reset after each interval. I'm really curious if the people in this room disagree, for instance, on the instrument artifacts here. Can we do a poll? Sure. Oh, sure. So, blue-coated blackboard. Oh, you have the same thing. Yeah, that's a good it was either a laptop or a projector. Overhead projector. It's hard to tell. There is an overhead projector in there that's lit. But I did overhead projector. Yeah. So, so I guess the question I had is why those are two different categories. I mean, if you're projecting a slide because it's on an overhead transparency versus it's on your computer, what does it matter? Like, to me, those are identical 
Yeah, yeah like isn't a slide more different? A, a slide and an overhead are, are more similar to each other than a PowerPoint slide and a fetch sim, right? Right. Those are both well, projected. Transparency, you can actually write on, whereas oh, yeah. a slide or a PowerPoint. Well, these days with a tablet, tablet. You can't write yeah. on it. Well, if you know how to well, use you have a smart PowerPoint, board. And <laughs> 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 it's complicated very quickly. But right, yeah, that, yeah. That's a good point. And I just feel like they're exactly the same thing. It's just you know, are you choosing to print it out and put yeah, up your purposes? Projected right. directly right. 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 So we may, we may take out slides and just use the the, the device that you're using to project something. Yeah, but we did. There was many classrooms, at least one that I observed, where people were writing on transparencies because they didn't have a tablet or they didn't have the technology. Right. Right. So it seems like that's the important part. Are you using it as something? But that's the important part, frankly, of the tool, yeah. which is to say, um, now maybe you're really interested in the tool itself, but the point is, is how is that tool being used? Right. Which is, am I dynamically creating content? Is there some sort of interactive component to it? Is there some sort of animated component to it? Or is it a static image? Even that's going to get fuzzy with um, PowerPoint animating, you know, bullet points that come up. But still, to me, it strikes me that those kinds of things are similar. So our long-term goal in this research is to develop the equivalent of the Hubble to study classroom instruction. Right now, we feel like we're holding up a microphone and a magnifying glass. So we have a long way to go to actually develop an instrument that captures some of the fine-grained elements of teaching practice and some of the feedback you're giving us, like at last week and we're getting in these talks, is really helping. So, especially the slides, because we what? wrestled with that one too. So, I have like, like a broader comment on this, um, which is it, it captures a lot of what the teacher's doing, but it doesn't actually capture what the students are doing that well. Like, it doesn't, there's no codes for students asking questions. Um, there's, you know, there's no codes that represent that. Or there is in that the full instrument, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't go beyond that very far. It does. It does. It go like the type of question because that's like students can ask very different types of questions. Like, oh, you missed a right. You know, that should be a plus instead of minus, <laughs> or they can ask them, like an actual question. That's, really that's a great idea because I think we had a code just whether or not a student asked a question, but we didn't have one for the types of question right. that was asked. Yes. But this ignores students completely, which is a <laughs> flaw. Common practice of faculty. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's it's one step in a larger research program. We're, we're hoping to do a next round of research where we do a pre and a post of student critical thinking skills that we could then link some of the specific practices we observe to student outcomes. But for now, we just want to get down how can we actually study classroom practice. And so, sorry, it seemed that the cognitive demands, I was asking myself, well, am I thinking from the perspective of the professor? Or am I thinking of the perspective of the student? Because right. the, the professor may be asking what he or she feels is this kind of cognitive demand, and the students are taking it in a very different way. So which perspective do you guys tend to look from? Well, yeah, it was, it was what what is the professor asking of the students, not necessarily did they actually carry out what was asked. Or were they even interpreting it as a, you know, integrating kind of concept? Yeah. Or yeah. asking it as a receiving? I mean, I think you can... It's, it's hard for me to see which perspective I'm looking at, but you're saying you I, I actually, I, I'll defend that. I think it's a great question, Ariel. Um, I would defend, though, looking at it from the instructor side, which is, um, at least at this point, this is what you have control over and also what you can observe and maybe agree on more. Which is to say, this is, in the, well, I, I was going to say, how is it that at least we as experts are interpreting what it is that the faculty are doing and asking of the students? Now, whether or not um, the faculty is asking it in a way that the students can interpret it and engage in it and do it is, is yet another level of nuance I think really important right. but yeah. separate. Maybe one more question and then we'll talk about how you analyze the data. Okay, so actually I have, I have a, a narrow question and a broader one. So the narrow one is just following up on this, on this point. I mean, I'm struggling with the cognitive demand um, aspect because I don't know the content of the biology at all. And so it's very difficult for me to evaluate whether it's problem solving or creating, for instance, the question that he asked. So, so how important is topical expertise on the part of the observer in, in terms of interpreting, in particular, that, that domain? Yeah, I, so yeah, we talked about this quite a bit um, because we, we were jumping around to differential equations, all right. kinds of physics, chemistry, and 
perhaps it's a rationalization from the position with which we're coming, which is as social scientists, but we felt with, at the very general level at which we were doing it, we didn't really need to have a deep understanding of the content for the following reason. If a professor is standing up and, and just uh, portraying information just through talking, as far as what he's demanding of the students, whether or not I understand exactly what he's saying, all he's really demanding is that they receive what he's saying and then they memorize it or write it down. Well, so let's get concrete. Um, yeah. So he asked a question early on of the students about, it was a sort of a what-if question. Was that um, problem-solving or creating or integrating? So it looks like half yeah. of is three. I just didn't code anything. I was like, yeah. Oh, I call it, I, I code it all three. Yeah, right. I call it next to hers, and I, I do too. So, so um, you know, I think... I, not knowing the content, I couldn't figure out what was the nature of that, like, what was the nature of the, the cognitive advance. This is a yeah. bad program. So. So problem, <laughs> problem solving we limited to somebody, mostly in a chalkboard, working out an equation or a solution pattern, ah. talking about an actual problem in that sense. I'm so that narrowed it down to two others. But yeah. I mean, like biology, oh, okay. they have, their problems are just Right, but what, what problem is actually, like, are they problem solving or are they recalling a bit of information that they're expected to yeah, know? But what's happening here, like in this network? Yeah, what, 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 what was he doing there? What was that right, I mean, he, 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 he it, like, I heard his question and there was a, I put a question mark next to creating new ideas because there was a hint of, like, well, what do you think could be going on there? Like, that is definitely creating. There was there was something, <coughs> some phrasing like that that he used. Right. Um, but that could have been integrating yeah. because and you could have already given them the answer and they just have to apply it in this particular right. situation. And students are being asked to understand analytic process in, in that question too. Right. So a lot of this is an artifact of you coming cold to this. When we went through the training, integrating prior knowledge, we only coded if somebody used a verbal marker saying, now remember last week. Or remember what I talked about two minutes ago. And again, oh, you have to actually have to tell them that they need to integrate. Again, we're missing a lot of things, but <laughs> this is, you are not integrating. <laughs> well, not integrating. But that seems to be missing, like, as an instructor, I want them to integrate without having to tell them that that's what they're doing. Right. Now, going to your question, if we did have discipline-based experts doing the coding, we can get a lot deeper and I think we'd have much stronger results. But again, like Joe said, at this point, we're just trying to capture some of the you know, top level observable behaviors. And we're gonna miss some of the new ones, but hopefully we'll improve this over time. So let me, let me continue on with the broader question. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you're heading back to this. So you started off by talking about why are, why are we doing this? Why are we trying to characterize teaching in this way? And I'm, I'm struggling with that a little bit. Like I'm trying to imagine one of the things you, you implied was that this could be productive for the teachers themselves as a method of reflecting on their own teaching. Um, so I, you know, I'm sort of imagining I've got I've got an observer in my room, and I get back this piece of paper with you know a bunch of circles on codes. No, you, <coughs> you would never see that. Uh huh. So so how then do I use this? And so I'm now I'm asking the broader purpose again. Purpose. Thank you. Wait the next one. Yeah. Um. So I should have warned you. you. You should have planned for like half the amount of data you wanted to cover. <laughs> with this oh, real quick. No, we're gonna do this part quick. <laughs> yeah. This this part will be quick. So this is how we entered the data. Basically, every code gets a column, and then it's just a series of ones and zeros. Was that code observed in this particular interval for this faculty member? So every faculty member ends up with multiple rows of data for every interval with which they, for which they were observed. And then it's just a simple ones and zeros after that. So every code then, uh, or looking at it from a matrix perspective, there's a value for whether or not something was observed or whether it was not. It's just a one or a zero, not how often that happened in that five minute interval. Exactly. Now there is, you can actually put in gradation. We did that in the, in the middle school example where we put uh, a two in instances in which that was uh, took up more than half the interval, if it was a dominant activity. In this case, we just, if it happened or not. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways to actually analyze the data. The way in which we're going to describe is you take that initial matrix uh, and you transpose it and then multiply it by the transpose and you get a code by code matrix. So all the codes that are along the, the rows and the same that are crossed by themselves across the columns, 
with the main diagonal being the number of intervals in which each code uh, was observed. And so then you can look at cross-coding. So when, for example, um, lecture was coded, and how many intervals was uh, were overhead projectors coded? So then you can start to explore uh, the cross between all the different codes. First, go to the subject Oh, right. And something that instructors might find is, well, in what proportion of the intervals that you observed of me, in what proportion did you see lecture, for example? So, for example, uh, among the mathematicians that we observed, in 75% of all the intervals, we observed what we had described as lecturing. In physics, 93%. In chemistry, 81%. In biology, 84%. And so on. You can just give a very rough descriptive account uh, of the extent to which or the frequency with which each code was observed. So you could also just give that to one particular instructor and say, throughout that, to that, that, flip, flip back to that slide that is made. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of these data are in that policy brief that was handed out. So, one way in which we've been able to graph the co-occurrences, that matrix I was telling you about where you have codes by codes, was to use a technique in social network analysis where rather than looking at social ties between people, you're looking at ties between codes. And so in this particular graph, this is the mathematicians in our sample. And it's, it's, you're not going to be able to see the code labels, but um, the line thickness is the frequency with which the codes uh, were co-occurred, have co-occurred with one another. So, for example, you can immediately look at these codes were central, so I can't even see that from this perspective, but it's, this is problem solving, this is recall memorizing, this is lecture, this is working out problems, conceptual questions, blackboard. You see that that is sort of their central repertoire, that's what they went to most often, and used those uh, in combination with one another. But they also supplement them quite often with algorithmic questions, as you might expect. Um, and then, for example, here, you like the, the red dots are the cognitive demands, the blue square are the teaching techniques, and the purple diamonds are the artifacts. And so this just gives, and these are all unobserved codes. And Don't that just you, gives. Uh, design on physical locations of the dots on that graph? Yeah, so the program also has a way in which it, um, it minimizes the overlap of the lines, and it also is trying to put the, the nodes that co occurred most often closest together. So it does have a center in the center. So it does have a spatial um, element to it to the extent that it's trying to minimize or I guess maximize uh, similarity in terms of distance. In that way, it's similar to uh, multi-dimensional scaling if you're familiar with that technique. But we thought that this was actually more appropriate because the lines give you the sense of strength of tie between each pairs of codes. And all of these graphs are in the policy brief so they can seem a little bit more clear. Then another measure you can offer uh, from a graph theoretic perspective is the graph density, and that's just a measure of, um, of all the possible connections between codes, what proportion of them were observed in the graph. So in this particular one, uh, there's a graph density of 0.335, which means of all the possible ties, <coughs> theoretically all the possible ties, 33% were observed. So a tie is defined how again? It's defined as uh, co-occurring in the same interval. Same five minute interval. Exactly. Even, even if they have no logical connection, if they just occur near each other in time. Exactly. There's a connection exactly. On the right. Yep. So that's where you have to actually, in your interpretation, you have to do a little bit of theoretical work, meaning, okay, if we observe these codes together, but we know they're only together because they happen in the same interval, then you don't want to make any interpretations that, for example, these things are going together and that they're doing a lot of work. Which is why when we created what we call it. Uh, triads, for example, working out problems, problem solving, blackboard. So it's where we looked at in what proportion of intervals did artifact, particular artifacts, teaching techniques, and cognitive demands co-occur. So now instead of looking at just cross tabulations, we're looking at by three. And we picked ones where that we observed in the classroom as actually being happening together, not just co-occurring in the same interval, but actually being used in unison. And so, for example, working out problems, problem solving, and at the blackboard occurred 38.6% of the competition's <coughs> intervals. So this is the physicist's graph, and as you see, it's much more diffuse uh, than the mathematicians. Uh, their density is much higher, 0.538, so they're, of all the possible connections, 
53% as opposed to 33% were observed. Um, the most frequently used triads were the lecture received memorized with slides at 50% and lecture received memorized at the blackboard. But also you can see that there's a lot of uh, work going on um, with horse clickers. Here. Yeah, so clickers were frequently used in this particular example um, as we're drawing connections, um, integration. So in comparison to the, um, if you go back to the math, like you can see there's a, a lot more codes that are completely detached from the graph, meaning they were never observed to be used in any of the uh, intervals. And then you go back to the physicists, you see that there's quite a few that uh, were never used at all. And so here's biologists, for example. I mean, here, among the biologists we observed, it was the lecture, laptop, and slides uh, received memorized. So mainly PowerPoint presentations taking place over the uh, majority of the class period, although they were the ones who did use most of the small group work. Um, they also had a density that sort of fell in between the two. And then finally, here's a graph that you can give to one individual faculty member. So this was a case study that we did with a mathematician. And here is his individual graph for one class period. So we can see um, in this class period, he made use of these uh, five, uh, well, I guess one artifact being the blackboard. He lectured, um, problem solving, received, memorizing. I can't, I can't quite Word problems. Word problems, right. So that was sort of his core repertoire in this particular class. But he did a lot of creating, or asking of them to create a lot of algorithmic questions, comprehensive, uh, comprehension questions. Um, and a little bit of connections, rhetorical <coughs> questions, uh, illustrations. So, but obviously a lot of the codes are not used. But you can see that sort of the different levels at which you can slice the data or, or create graphs. You know, we did it at the disciplinary level, but also at the individual level. This particular case is interesting because this individual had no knowledge of educational research or learning science, but he was doing a modified version of peer instruction. And in my opinion, really well. But when I asked him about it, he said, what? Peer instruction? And that's kind of captured with the small group work, blackboard, and creating. So he kind of did what the, what the biologist did, you know, worked out a solution path, talk to your neighbor, you know, do that for two or three minutes and report back. So this is another thing we thought about doing as well, where uh, this is Daniel McFarland, who's doing this in the context of a high school classroom, where he's looking at uh, conversation patterns between the teacher uh, and the students in the class. And we've been thinking about actually creating a movie uh, for our own data where we just show uh, the connections of the codes as they unfold across each five minute interval. Uh, it's just another way in which faculty might be able to visualize what they're doing across a uh, particular class period. Because it might be actually really telling for a faculty member, say for example, um, if nothing really moves across an entire class period, that would be a very good visual representation that while nothing is really moving me, I'm not really changing up my practice at all. Or maybe there's just very subtle fluctuations. Or maybe somebody sees that it's complete chaos. And maybe, you know, that, at that point you can evaluate whether that's good or bad. But um, this is just another way in which we can look at the data. And another thing that you can do is, for example, you could take measures such as graph density, or you could take measures such as um, the proportion of intervals in which working problems at the blackboard um, and requiring problem solving, taking that proportion or the graph density and using that as a predictor variable in a regression analysis or anything that you're trying to, uh, and some outcome that you're trying to link to teaching. Or you might want to actually predict teaching. What are the factors that predict um, what it is that an instructor is actually doing in their classroom? So you can use those as either indicator variables or outcome variables. Um, so a couple other points. One, we, we didn't intend for this to be a measure of quality. So for example, if somebody lectured a lot in their classroom, some what we observed, some people did it very well. Some people had a monotone for 50 minutes. But some people used it in integration with different styles of questions. So that's a whole other step that we really have to address. But we didn't want there to be an equation with a particular technique and any level of quality. Now you can certainly get to that point but we, with this particular instrument, with the data that we used, we weren't ready to make that assumption because we also saw uh, instances in which people were using lots of different techniques, small group work, um, integrating technology, but not always very effectively, meaning students weren't always on task. I mean, these are things that were 
coming out of our nodes. Uh, so it's, it's, that's a whole other link that needs to be drawn. Uh, these data only reflect large classes, and so we didn't look at discussions, labs, tutorial sessions, which is obviously another context through which these types of um, situations can be analyzed. And that's the, the result, and we, we uh, believe is a multidimensional temporal account of teaching practice. But obviously, once you get to that stage of representation, these representations are bound up with all of the issues that were arise in the past 10 to 15 minutes. I mean, those are things that can easily get swept under the table when you look at a graph, just as in any student assessment data, if you're looking at a table of regression coefficients, that doesn't account for all the error that goes into the way in which those were measured. And the same thing applies here, which is why we're working really hard to get to that point to have better measures. Um, <coughs> I think we're <coughs> running short on time. Some discussions <coughs> might be entertained as we go through our research. One is characterizing teaching as lecture versus interactive methods, useful or valid. And our point is that in some extreme cases that may be so, but empirically we think that there's enough variation within individual teaching practices that that's not suitable. And especially what Joe was just saying, lectures become kind of a maligned teaching practice, and there's been a lot of educational research on this point that it can be an effective tool. It can also be used very ineffectively, as you all know. But that's just one thing to consider. Then the other is the gap between the uh, views and needs of education researchers and STEM faculty is becoming increasingly documented. And we're suggesting <clears throat> that with depictions of practice, actually as they occur in local settings, um, that can be given to policymakers, people who are designing interventions, etc. just as a snapshot to say, this is what's going on right now, just so you know. You know, instead of coming in and having a top-down change initiative where you just say, do this, without any understanding of what's going on in the grassroots. So I think that this could be um, one of the data points that you could use to describe practice as it's occurring. And finally, our next steps, we're going to collect more data in the spring. Um, going to look at how people in the field are actually using the data or not, including department chairs, faculty developers, etc. Um, at some point, we need to link it to student outcomes and providing training and technical assistance that people who want to use the instrument. So thank you very much for your time and your attention and all of your great questions. And if you have any more questions, we'll be around for a little while to answer any that you may have. Thank you. So Noah has a question here. <laughs> I'm happy to defer. What? Defer to somebody. Okay, I have three questions. No. <laughs> no. Oh, I said oh. oh. Right. Um, well, so first off, I like this a lot, and I, I like that you're trying to build on a what's done, go beyond, and synthesize. I mean, classic problem, for instance, with the R talk, which is what we use um, or have used, um, is that it's only on classroom. So to go beyond the classroom and see that it's linked to other areas and. Um, also to build on theory, I think it's just fabulous. And I was sort of putting your work in the activity theoretic diagram and, and find that it actually matched pretty nicely. No surprise, I guess. So I, I just think that's great to, to have um, theoretical basis for this and, and consider this as a social enterprise of what's going on and, and, and the idea of building community. So I find those very valuable. Um, so I encourage you to continue on this. Um, that was a statement. That was a statement. <laughs> um, that was the preface. <laughs> you got a question. And, uh, no, 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 I always practice questions. <laughs> not, not always, right. Although some people have noticed the nicer of the compliment than mean of the question. So, um, well, I think, that, so my, my three questions are as follows. How is it that you find lecture? Right? And is that sort of consistent? Because I'm, I'm interested when you say that lectures are maligned, at least in, in, in PER, there's fairly consistent and reliable evidence that for people who self-describe as lecturer and only get up and work at the chalkboard, no matter what brilliant level of cognitive modeling is going on, um, at least there hasn't been published evidence that students make as uh, great uh, performance gains on these conceptual measures as with interactive uh, techniques, and whether that's Hake or our own work or lots of other folks since then. So it, it, I guess it depends on how you define lecture, and I, I was looking up the Soroy and Sell. Uh, Snell to see. Maybe they define lecture differently from 
what we call lecture. So that's a sort of simple question. Um, particularly the meat that I'd be interested in getting into is this idea of the five minute chunks that you look at. That exercise was very revealing to me when we went through. It compresses a tremendous amount. I mean, I filled in a large fraction of this bubble. And what it meant was, to me, I couldn't distinguish then between somebody using all of these techniques in an integrated way and going from episode to episode to episode to episode, which is what this fellow did, um, I think. Maybe intentionally designed to link them, but I don't think so, actually, is sort of my sense about what happened. So you lose that sort of fine-grainedness. I was just curious about the intention behind that and whether or not that prevents you from answering some of the questions about the dynamic variability in the classroom that you might want to answer. You sort of answered it in your data. I mean, you show variation in these questions already, so maybe that's enough. But um, So maybe I'll stop with those two questions. I do have a third. But. Okay, first one. What's election? What's election? Um, I believe we operationalize that when a person is standing in front of the classroom and orally delivering information. So like I said, it could be co-coded and probably will be with some other things like illustrations and anecdotes. Right. So it's just a very one definition. So I, I mean, lecture to me, I, I guess I would, ha I would have to operationalize that in terms of length of time too. Right. Um, I know, well, I guess mini lectures are often used in, in, in delivering a class, but it's not ongoing droning lecture for 50 minutes. Right, it seems like that code's gonna get it's going to get heavily used. Almost any five-minute, it, it's, it's you know fairly unusual to have uh, more than a five-minute chunk in a room with lots of students in which the instructor can say a word. Right. So that can happen. It does happen. But, but still, I would just expect that code gets overused. So you know, having a bin that's that's almost always coded seems to be totally problematic. Yeah. Right. So that's something that we could mull over. Um, one thing that we found interesting is I'd say that good majority of our interviews, we have people apologizing for lecture. Whether they were adept at um, you know, different pedagogical methods or not. But the, the fact that they were apologizing, and then some people who are using very sophisticated problem-based learning, all this stuff, say, but I have to talk. Mm -hmm. As if that's something that's bad. It, it's just something that struck us, that th there's this notion that people need to apologize for it. Lecture gets maligned inappropriately. Lecture is incredibly effective. It's just that... No, let's stop lecturing us. <laughs> it's just that they... I'll ask you to reflect on this in a moment, Stephen. Um, um, the, um, the overuse of lecture, the sole use of lecture, is appropriately maligned, at least as evidenced by the data that are out there self-described. So, so people who only get into this mode... Um, this is sort of getting to my third view, which is sort of this idea about beliefs. If people believe that what they're supposed to do is just simply present information, that's sort of aligned with this idea of pure lecture or only lecture, which I think is empirically um, something that is not as effective as taking... I am, I'm unaware of situations where professors don't lecture. That's the other thing. Even in studio physics classrooms or the pet classroom or something, right? People get up and present information for some chance of time. But that is a code, you're right, if it's coded in every interval, you know, what's the point? What's the point? Yeah. So we're You'll be able to distinguish, though, if it's only that code and no others. But that doesn't, still, if it's coded always, it's no good as never using it. It doesn't take that time. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So, do professors perceive what they do correctly, or in comparison to the coding? So if you came and coded our meeting or a class or something, like, would the interviews reflect that, or do they overestimate? Related, they there was a self-reported, um, the, professor. yeah, so that self-reporting of how much time do you spend in your class, and each thing, I was really interested if that lines up with, um, do, do you know Melissa? Melissa's doing this work. Yeah, I said one or two. I mean, we've, a we've asked and gotten the self-reports, but... And we've hoped that they were somewhat close to what was actually happening, but we don't know for sure. That's on our list of analyses to do, actually, because we have the survey data that we can link with the observation data. It won't be a perfect comparison because the, in the survey there's just fewer measures, but we can still get a sense of, based on their self-report, what proportion of their time is spent doing all these different techniques versus this. So we'll, 
we're going to be able to answer that question soon. We just haven't gotten to it yet. In, in our interview, we asked about what's your lesson plan if you have one for the class we're going to observe. And so we're in the process now of comparing that with what we actually observe. I know that um, a colleague of ours who works over in Atlas, Tim Weston, had tried to develop an instrument that would capture faculty self-report. And um, his initial results caused him just to toss out the entire project because the, the faculty were, it was all apple pie answers. Of course, of course I'm doing this. So um, their self-report was more positive than you could actually believe was occurring. But if it was consistently more positive, like if you knew that they always rate themselves 20% more than what they mm -hmm. actually are, then you, you can actually get a measure yeah. by asking them, right, as long as it's somewhat... Well, I, I guess if you, you have that is, error worked yeah. into the... Yeah. They're not randomly in error. They're always usually more likely, which mm -hmm. is less likely. Right. Well, I just have a factual question. Are you guys um, measuring a given faculty member multiple times, or just single shot? Twice. Twice, yes. But in our next study, we want to do it four times throughout a uh, semester or a quarter. Oh. Do they know the data? Yes. That's right. Like, they do you know tell them where you're coming, or oh, do you yeah. just and, and if they, they tell know. us, we have, we've been at each institution for one week, so if they say, we're, I'm given three lectures, one's a quiz, we won't go to that one. We'll go to something where they're actually teaching. So I find these social network graphs that you guys have pretty interesting, but I wonder about, like, the optimal brain size for collecting data, and whether that actually is different depending on the instructor that you're um, observing. Um, because the, the connections you're making are highly dependent on the internal correlations, right? I mean, the, the density of those lines. Yep. I wonder if you can look at that. So you mean if we're two like random intervals rather, rather, five? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's sort of some optimum, optimum, right? You want internal correlations, so you don't want to go down to 30 seconds, but you don't want to do 10 minutes. I see what you're saying, all right. That's sort of, you know, yeah, this idea so of so Yeah, I'm wondering if you look at that. Yeah, and she has a question. Yeah, I mean, I can really bring it. Oh, OK. Um, so you said that you want to link what? teacher is doing to student learning. So I think there's definitely a step between there. We have to look at what the teacher is doing and the students mm -hmm. as in equilibrium with each other. And then the outcome of that is sort of, and I think it's going to be important to make observations of the entire system. I'm a chemist, so I'm thinking reactants, products, equilibrium with each other, they're all in the same container. We're interested in the energy of that reaction. Students are engaged in another activity system, and they may or may not be overlapping about what's going on. The students think that there's some other goal about what's going on. Here, I'm in charge of getting the answer. The faculty think, "Ha, huh, I'm working with the students, and they're trying to do some meaning making." And those sit often, you know, from activity theory at odds with one another, and then they merge into something new in a fine dialect. So we had a category that we eliminated, <laughs> but it was student engagement. We just had low, medium, high. We talked about a blunt measure. But we were trying to capture that, but we found that it would require at least two analysts doing the observation, one person watching the instructor, and one, like, it would almost be like a transect of the class. Let's look at these 10 students. How many are Facebooking? How many are paying attention? How many are asking questions? So it, might, it might be interesting, and this actually came up this morning. We're trying to, we, we need this tool for the research that I'm doing to figure out what's going on with faculty. The problem is that, you know, particularly with the type funding at NSF, getting the funds to go in and you can't travel there so one thing you can do is get videotapes which basically is very difficult and then it takes time to analyze it. So the reason we haven't done this is because we, it's too expensive and time consuming to do. And one of the things we were talking about this morning, I'd be interested in your feedback on it, is um, what happens if we um, ask the students you know, what percent of time were you engaged in discussion in this class? You know, to what extent did you talk to other people in the class?
class, what level were the questions that you were asked, if they would be able to give us somewhat of an accurate reflection. Do you know? Have you tried that? Or It might be interesting to do this and then also ask the students at the same time. They might be able to do this for you. Yeah, that's a great idea. And that's something you could do on the larger scale. scale. And our feeling was that we can actually get that. We can for 100 faculty get that data. We can't do this for 100 faculty. Right. right. One of three. get an accurate picture across a department yes. or an institution. Anybody. Yeah, you can't. You can't do it on the large scale. And there's some way that you can get the same information. And actually, I would even hypothesize that the students' reflections might be more correlated to student outcomes <coughs> than the faculty's perception. Because we get, for example, you know, this one faculty member I was reading, they're like, oh, yes, of course, we have lots of discussions in class. We talk about this and we talk about that. And the reality is that the only conversation is going one way, you know, right. but that's their perception of it. You saw that in, in this video, that the yeah. professor had a whole class discussion, and I think there were two students responding. Yeah. I don't know how big the lecture hall was, but... Well, he asked, like, yes, he said, turn to your neighbor and talk, and then 30 seconds later, he's getting soliciting information. So um, I'm going to suggest we wrap up, being sensitive to uh, time going on. But uh, Matt and Joe, you guys are going to stick around for a little bit. Do you have time now? Yes. I think me more than Joe. He has to Skype teach a class. Oh, right. you got to go teach a class in, well, half an hour. Right. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so let's thank the speaker.